Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akio, and if you're interested in how to find your path in today's data science field, this episode is for you. Joining me today is Massimiliano Ungheretti. He's a data scientist over at TomTom and he's working on voice assistant technology, obviously using AI. Enjoy. Beyond coding. I asked you this question and you did listen to a lot of podcasts, no? Yeah, although I should admit only a couple of episodes of this one. No, this one is fine. I don't I yeah. don't get offended. What yeah, no, say? I do, I do. You know what? It actually the podcast became part of sort of um of a daily routine yeah. that really helped me to get a clear break in the stress cycle during the day. Okay. Middle of the day, 12 o'clock, no matter what, I go outside. Okay. And I listen to something that kind of, you know, breaks the arc of the day. And yeah. When you, when you get back, you feel different. And the podcasts or calling family and friends, that's part of that. And you do that standard 12 each day. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I should do that as yeah. well. Today I moved it up a little bit. Sure, so fair I can enough. Make it in time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's really nice. And have you have you done that for how long? Um, I think it's it's during during the pandemic it became much more important to me. Yeah. Before that, I would occasionally do it. Okay. Sort of only when I was too stressed, mm -hmm. and then I realized, you know what, it's better to use it in maintenance mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was good. yeah, but before that, I was trying to be very social during lunch. Okay. In the office setting. Yeah. So it, there wasn't a room, room in my life. Yeah. And now there is. Yeah, that makes sense. I do the social bit, and especially when working from home, like my partner is also there, and we would either cook and have lunch together, or already have something left over, warm it up, and still have lunch together, and then do more of the social dynamic, and then get back to work. Yeah. But when you're at the office, you're. I feel like I'm always on. Yeah, it's very hard to turn. Yeah. Turn off. Yeah. Yeah, and then although I think smokers do get a small they get smokers <laughs> break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I used to work in operations, uh, I had colleagues that didn't smoke but would take like a how do you say that a secondhand smoke break. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, actually, I was at some point in a team where smoking. I started to get the feeling maybe it could even get you a little career opportunity because mm. you get more face-to-face -face time. Yeah. With the important people that smoked. They're the most social people. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's uh, but smoking now is kind of out of fashion more and more. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Although the it, smokers were the ones that let me into the building. <laughs> they got you in. I I should say something. I was it was I was really surprised that you were already sitting there. Did, mm -hmm. did you see me? I had to do a double take. I was like, double that, take. I saw. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm also not wearing glasses. So <laughs> yeah, go. that was also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That makes. Well, sense. this reminded me of um, all of a sudden, when I was in my last job at ING, I yeah. was working in uh, fraud detection, anti-money laundering, terrorism financing. So the group that takes security pretty seriously. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I ran into someone who, after only a while, I found out that they were, you know, someone who tests, you know, who does penetration testing using social engineering. So they're exactly the people who will try to, you know, tailgate or talk themselves into a building through the smoker's entrance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Interesting. Talk to me about ING because I saw on your LinkedIn that that was kind of the first instance where you had the role of a data scientist. Before there, I saw you were a software engineer, you did your PhD as well. Was ING kind of the first professional experience data science wise? Yeah, I think to a large extent it was. Mm. Although before that, I was doing a bit of research into uh, machine learning for physics. Yeah. That's what got me interested into it when I had a big you know, when you have to make the big choice after academia, am I going to be a professor or am I going to go join a company? Mm -hmm. um, and I remembered that one of the things that excited me most in the last years while I was studying was a project I was doing, applying, you know, read this big machine learning book and apply it to this problem we have in processing all of this data for this particle detector at CERN. Yeah. Um, so that was my first exposure to it, doing a project in that. And it was clear, like, man, I got to do this, combine the programming, the math, all of that, data scientist. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I landed at ING mm -hmm. because they somehow managed to, they, they enticed me with the idea of catching baddies. Okay. Uh, at least that's, that's what stood out for me. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't super interested in the hardcore finance stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I had already figured that out. Although I was interested in it 
you know, theoretically or doing it for, you know, reading up for fun, but I couldn't imagine that being my job. Yeah. So uh, I found a place where I could go catch baddies, but for, you know, in a bank, not for the police or the government. Yeah, different time. Very different environment. Yeah. Yeah. Learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think cool. if I look back, I was way in way over my head. Really? My first project. Starting out? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I actually, when I came out of uni, I applied to ING, also for data scientist position. I just didn't get in. I didn't have the work experience. I went through the first round and then the second round, they were like, yeah, we're looking with, for someone with like two or three years of experience. I was like, I have zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, yeah. I ended up joining operations. So I never actually, we did in, in university, I did do some data science courses. I had some Python here and there, not much web development, but a little bit. So data science was always kind of on the path, uh, but just to, I think a combination of circumstances, I never actually ventured down a deeper rabbit hole when it oh. came to data science. Are you still interested? I'm still interested actually. And now I joined since two weeks at ING, but not as a data scientist now, not even as a software engineer, as a product manager. And now I have data scientists in the team as well. So I'm going to try and figure out how to work together because I've never worked with data scientists in the same team. Ah, I see. Yeah. All right. But you said you were you were in over your head. Was it kind of just to the grandeur of things? Were there too many things going on? Was it because of the environment or why was that? I, um, I had a project where I don't think I got, I really grasped the sheer size of the challenge. Okay, so the grandeur, yeah. <laughs> that was the, the, the very first one. Okay. Uh, it took a while for that to sort of uh, get more structure, mm. more structure around you. When you're just starting out, um, I think a lot of people are not very good with dealing with lots of ambiguity. Uh, add to that some politics, maybe, mm. you know, lacking technologies even. If you have to solve all of it, yeah. that is the first thing you do. That's hard. The chances of, you know, gaining momentum of actually you know, uh, hitting it out of the park every now and then, you know. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but stay enthusiastic. So I think my enthusiasm got the be got the best of me. Okay, yeah. Um, Ambition probably as well coming yeah, out of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, the, the, there was a senior person who I was supposed to uh, work with, mm. uh, but they left after a couple months. Okay. And then, of course, I could decide to go to a different project or not, because it was kind of an internal consultancy, uh, but I decided I wanted to stay on for a bit. Yeah. Probably I should have rotated projects and get back to the topic later. Okay. Because it, yeah, that took me a while yeah. to figure that out. Is that stubbornness? Is that yes, ambition? Yes, and I, I, yeah. And I asked the question a couple of times to people I respect. Like, okay. How do you figure out when to stop something that you're excited about, mm -hmm. but you realize it's not happening? Well, if you realize it's not happening, you're probably already are ready to stop. But actually, knowing when to quit something is the most yeah. difficult decision to take at anything. Yeah, like starting is easy. S stopping just because there's no momentum is also easy mm -hmm. because you just get distracted. Yeah. But when you stop, if you find something exciting, but you're maybe not making the progress you want to. Yeah, that's hard. I'm that's still hard. figuring that out. No, but I don't. I don't think um, so. There's never going to be an answer that satisfies you, I think, because you're never going to know the other side of that answer. Exactly. That's the counterfactual the is the data scientist call it, right? Yeah, that's how, it, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. It's a whole subfield of data science. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something outside deep learning, huh? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense yeah. <laughs> that there would be. I mean, you you talked about kind of letting go. Was that also when you then took the step and moved to TomTom Tom, or did you do other no, stuff? No, I just first? rotated to other topics. Yeah. So, um, and actually later on, I came back to the topic mm. and did some more small projects in that. Yeah. Um, but that was when the rest of the organization around was maturing a bit towards that. So not, you know, there was actually place for a, a meteor in there. Yeah, that makes sense. When we talk about, because I'm curious about comfort, right? Whenever I got into a role, I started out in operations and it took me a while, months, maybe a year down the line before I got actually comfortable in what I was doing, comfortable enough and confident enough to actually get stuff done. And then I moved to software engineering and that, that confidence kind of dropped and it dropped probably <laughs> below zero because I felt you like I was, start all over I, again, was, right? I was starting behind, I felt like even. Um, but then again, you build up that confidence. When, when did you feel kind of that confidence when it comes to data science? Was that an ING or when was that and what project 
kind of the setting? Well, I think you'll always feel a little bit like an imposter. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear the, the best people in the world talk about that. For me, it goes up and down. Yeah. So looking a bit for external signals and mm. staying realistic in that, you know, so going like, okay. So if I'm one year in, you know, I'll go ask around what's a normal number of projects. So what is a typical impact that you've had for most people in the first couple of years? Probably if they really add it up, it's not much. Mm. Yeah. Um, I also believe it's, it's going to be pretty important to place yourself in the situations where the chances are pretty good. Okay. Or if it works out, the impact is gigantic. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have like such an impact where you were like, okay, this is, this is what I want now and in the future? Some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I also had some where I really enjoyed the process, you know, had this big impact. And then I looked back and I'm like, yeah, I'm really proud of how I did it. Yeah. But I don't think I want to do this again. Okay, really? Yeah. Why is that? Because of the of the type of impact. So this this was, for example, a uh, a project where moving a certain kind of model by one percent point mm -hmm. on whatever metric would make many millions. Really? Yes, because okay. of the sheer size of the problem. Yeah. So if you, for example, if you're giving out mortgages in you know an entire country. And there's, I don't know how many tons of millions of people and each mortgage is half a million. Yeah, that makes sense. You can sense. imagine if you move that by one point, Yeah, it moves. Um, and I realized that <coughs> these problems could really grab my attention because it's my mathematical background. Mm -hmm. But in the end, what I did with it, I realized it didn't give me satisfaction in the outcome. Okay, yeah. What, what would give you satisfaction then? Because you then probably yeah, also- Yeah, so then I realized actually like tinkering and building you get this really nice fuzzy feeling and then showing it to people. Yeah. I started to realize that, you know, those, those types of things I really love. Okay. And discovering the cases. So kind of uh, scanning an area of a business mm -hmm. and then identifying, look, this thing is really, you know, if you frame it this way, you know, it becomes math mm -hmm. and you can optimize it. Yeah. Is that, usually what data science does as well. So kind of that discovery track, because it feels like that goes, that's kind of further in front of what I see usually data scientists focus on. But maybe that's my perception. I think it's also part of the opportunities that the people maybe get. And okay. if they take it, yeah. right? Um, I was fortunate to be in that, to have that opportunity a couple of times. Okay. But I also saw some people who were, who in their mind, they were stuck for a long time, they were just gonna have to analyze whatever was sent to them. Mm. So very reactive. Yeah, and that's probably the reality of some some jobs also. Yeah, right. If it has to be done, it sometimes has to be done. But yeah, that makes sense. Is that where you want to be? Yeah, that's a good question. Before we get into kind of data science in the field nowadays, um, you referred you to me. Uh, mm -hmm. You. I, I had her in a previous conversation. We talked a lot about kind of what does TomTom Tom do with generative AI. How much are you involved or how much are data scientists involved in kind of the gen AI stuff there? Or is that data engineering? Um, from the start. From the start. Yeah. 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 And then what do so you do? I, was, I was the first full-time employee on that story that she talked about. And um, that's cool. Man, what a year. <laughs> what a year. That's cool. So, for two years before that, I was like super excited about whatever transformer models and all the advances in NLP. Trying to sell this everywhere all the time. Going, like, look, this problem can be solved with that. And then it got an interface. Yeah. And everyone realized what I meant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's all you needed to do. <laughs> exactly. So, then, um, I mean, the. Really, the opportunities were created because, you know, I felt like I was allowed to go invest some time into this mm -hmm. uh, because of her efforts. Yeah. And I got the opportunity to do that full time. So that's that was, cool. yeah. That, that's that's great. Cool. That's great. So, yeah, yeah the, the, meat, the meat of it basically is uh, we've been working on building an assistant, a voice assistant for, for cars. Yeah. And you can imagine, you know, for data scientists, that's an excellent place to be. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're still working on that? Yeah. Because that I feel like that's never going to be done, done. 
No. So you have to, you know, right now I'm trying to figure out what my, what, what's my place in that story. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And are you, are you more, or do you get more energy out of figuring out how things work or why things work or what, what needs to be done and then being hands off with that work or how much are you involved in the nitty gritty, let's say detail? Because I know you have a mathematical background as well. Yeah. Well, what, what I said before, like building stuff. Mm. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Although I'm starting to care less who actually writes the code. Okay. But I do yeah. touch it. And of course, trying out the de- new techniques, um, staying up to date with what's possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that allows you to react and spot the opportunities. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, now after there's been this huge conference at CES <laughs> where every, every car manufacturer is showing off that they are considering putting AI in their cars, you know, and how, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, st- to stand there and show that you need to actually be aware of the opportunity, you know, one year before because someone needs to build something. Yeah, yeah exactly. That was cool. So for that, you have to read the papers, uh, know what's happening and uh, have the ability to actually build. So it's not just something you're thinking. It's actually, look, here is an example. So you can show it to people and get feedback as fast as you can. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I see a lot of similarities in there in, in myself as well that I I like building. Like I feel like there's complexity, try and figure out how, how things work, how to get stuff done. It fulfills me. But now more and more I care about the outcomes rather than what I do in there. And mm-hmm. if someone helps me achieve that outcome, if I'm not writing or contributing as much, it still fills me, I think. For me, it's about the outcome of the team, let's say, or this product that we're doing. And I'm trying to play around also with my role. That's why I, I said I'm going to be product manager um, to see if that part also fulfills me and to try it out because I think that might be interesting. So right. that's the... That's the yeah, this will be a very new world for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Product <laughs> management is going to be so indirect how you're going to yeah. have the impact probably. That's, um, that's what I feel like. And I've only been there for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Two, actually, uh, don't even have my laptop yet. And now I'm like, okay, what, what, where is my value, right? Because it's not on the technical stuff. I have people, I have colleagues that talk about the technical stuff and I can trust them. So then where is my value? It's more so trying to figure out what we need to do or where the value is or talking about uh, the domain with the stakeholders or talking to the end users. Yep. It's like a whole field <laughs> and I, I need to pick and choose what to do and I'm, I'm trying and doing my yeah. best. Well, I, I'm guessing you're going to have to there's going to be way more that you want to do that yeah. you can do. I hope so. And probably that problem is going to be worse than when you were a developer. I think so. I think so. But also nowadays, instead of from the developer hat trying to advocate for what I think is right, I feel like I have more skin in the game and a bigger authority to say, okay, this is what we're going to do because of X, Y, Z reason. And I can justify that in such a way that I wanted it justified to me. At least that's my ah, vision. Yeah, good point. That's my vision. Mm. Yeah. If I can... Uh, do justice to that. We'll have to see. <laughs> yeah. Maybe promise yourself, you know, write it down. I'm going to ask feedback. Exactly uh, this feedback question yeah. to the person A, B, and C in two months. Yeah. And I, I did that actually. You already did? Yeah. I don't, I'm not great with yearly goals. So this year I only have one goal and that's to do more and ask more feedback. So I've, I talked to, I've, I've written this down every month, at least the first month, if I'm on a new assignment, I want feedback. And then every X months from there down the line. A full 360, so everyone involved, not just pick and choose who I think is going to give good feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have done that thing. before. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, fully honest there. But I think it's valuable, especially if I'm in a new role, to kind of learn and grow there. Yeah. So that's uh, that's my that's journey. That's a good approach. <laughs> <laughs> that's my journey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, I'm i curious to hear your thought on kind of how the, let's say, data engineering or even data in general, data science field has changed because I feel like when I came out of uni, data science was like a, a buzz term. It was on a lot of articles that said a uh, few years down the line, data scientists are going to make the most money because that's what attracted me back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so it was definitely on my radar. And I mean, I shared as well due to a combination of circumstances. I never, I never went down that path. Maybe I lost sight of money somewhere down the road. Uh, but in any case, I'm sure things have evolved since then. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know how data scientists work nowadays versus how it used to be. For example, are you in a product team? How much do you yeah, 
sure. collaborate with data engineers or software engineers? Like what is the day to day compared to how it was previously? Yeah. I mean, I think the most obvious one mm. is tooling. Yeah. I mean, tooling and cloud. Although, you know, not every, <laughs> I think a lot of people in tech overestimate how much cloud there is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, what the cloud adoption is, mm. you know, so many enterprises are not, you know, really utilizing it. Yeah, not yet. Uh, or, or maybe they're util utilizing the mach machines, but no cloud services ap apart from that, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, just shouting cloud sounds maybe boring, but man, it makes a difference. Because mm. I remember also projects where, you know, we would actually have to go and make a change in an Excel sheet and then maybe email or call someone mm. to request some firewall setting to be changed and then maybe, yeah. Yeah, all of that. Instead of you just click, now I can run, you know, what I want. Yeah. That's a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, I think if you're talking, whatever, before I became a data, a data scientist, the profile that we're looking for often, like basically PhD was pretty much a requirement. Really? F for a while, in the beginning. Yeah. Um, I think that is not the case anymore. Okay. And it was the case because basically if you, ha if you wanted to, to have an algorithm, uh, to use an algorithm, you had to, first of all, probably imp implement it from scratch. Mm. Um, in a pretty low level language probably also. Okay, yeah. And you needed to be able to do the math. The, the job became a bit easier in that respect, like less academic. Yeah. Because it, there's way more things you can take off the shelf. Hmm. So I mean, that makes, I think, all the difference. So between that, somewhere in the middle, I joined. Okay, of course. <laughs> so I did some of that, you know, implemented from scratch. That was more for the research. And then after that, you know, you... You mostly see how you can maximize, you know, the the number of things you finish. Okay. <laughs> so instead of doing one thing, it takes you the entire year now because you have tools. You can maybe have multiple shots of having impact in a year. Okay. That's pretty different. That's cool. Yeah, and I think what what's going to be relevant for for people who who are considering joining the field, there's something different now in terms of the role and what the expectations. Okay. Um, the title is assigned to all sorts of roles. <laughs> of course, like any title. But so, yeah, exactly. Software engineer, product manager, it can mean all sorts of things, right? Yeah. Um, you see different profiles within that, but now the companies that are grow growing up, mm -hmm. quote unquote, they are specializing their roles a bit more. Okay. So there will be, well, the, the data engineer was the first thing to be kind of split off. Mm-hmm. Um, the difference between, you know, being a, an analyst and a data scientist is becoming a bit, the, the data scientist is kind of a catch-all okay. and the analyst is clear. It's more like analysis. So basically, usually one-off or you do some, some BI stuff. Mm -hmm. The machine learning engineer, the research scientist, Okay. Yeah. The research engineer. Yeah. So it the profiles that they're looking that, you know, companies are looking for are becoming a little bit clearer mm -hmm. than they were a couple of years ago. That's good. Because they were all in one term and now there's different titles for these things. But still it pays to <laughs> read the role description. Yeah. And then check on if that is also real. Yeah. Right? Because it happens I, I've heard a couple of people that go they are go into a company based on some role description and in the end of course it's not what they expect mm -hmm. yeah that always happens yeah yeah that's a that's a hard one yeah interesting yeah but so, find out what you enjoy about where you are anyway then that informs the decision of what you're going to do next yeah maybe in the same place maybe somewhere else so the the role in and of its own is less of a catch-all and is getting more specialist is that what you're saying yeah. like yeah i think so they're taking bits and pieces and that that's then kind of those responsibilities fall under a different title or a different umbrella. Yeah. Um, yeah that makes yeah. sense. I think. Although I think mm. in the beginning, probably, you know, the, the, the entry level job probably still reads data scientist or data engineer. Yeah. I don't think as far as I know, I don't think there are going to be entry level machine learning engineer positions, for example. Okay. Maybe there are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've, I've not looked into this 
for a long, long time, obviously, because I am not in that level yet, nor mostly in the data field. Uh, but I do get questions with regards to software engineering, for example. If I were to start out now, would I do, for example, a, a PhD? Because um, there's pros and cons there. Would I do even a master? Some people are questioning that. Or do mm -hmm. I need a bachelor's? People yeah. go even in front of that. And for software engineering, I have more of kind of a clear view there, I think, here and there, or what you can do portfolio-wise or how you can distinguish yourself. But I have no clue when it comes to the data side of things. Is it comparable, you think? Is it, okay, build up a portfolio, show what you can do. Is it similar to that? Or how can you distinguish yourself when you're going, let's say, for those entry-level data science positions or data engineering positions? Yeah. Well, PhD is not a necessity. Okay. I don't, I don't think so. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. Unless you're looking for a research position. Okay. And even then, probably, if you got the papers, but not the PhD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, you can qualify in all sorts of ways, right? Yeah. So the, and, and if it's your first job, all you're trying to do with all of those little experiences and is just qualify yourself, usually just to get an interview. Mm. Basically, that whole list, the CV, the whole point is that they are okay to talk to you. Yeah. And then probably there's, you know, in some decision making a little bit based on the credentials, but will probably be mostly the impression you give and the answers you give yeah. in the interview. Would you say then you need a portfolio to get that seat at the table or what's your experience there? So that's what I assumed when I got into it. Okay. So I started, you know, whatever, doing half a project. And then I thought, you know what, in the meantime, let's also go to all the meetups. Okay. And that's what got me the first job. The meetups. Yeah. Nice. So while I was doing this portfolio stuff, I was like, okay, let's see uh, what the people who are already in the field are actually talk talking about and thinking yeah. instead of my impression here from outside and the internet and maybe, you know, maybe it doesn't match reality. Yeah. I so love that. Started going, you know, just talk to people, you know, have some questions ready because you might, you might be, you know, depending on how you are, you might be, too embarrassed or you might be nervous or like you know what did you enjoy doing today you know at your job yeah or like if you weren't working where you are where'd you where go where would you be exactly yeah, yeah. so that there's no cop out there yeah like oh at my, at my place <laughs> <laughs> by the way we're hiring yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's uh that is super smart and you can do that within any tech related field whether you want to be a cloud engineer software engineer yeah. anything data related, going to meetups, meeting the people there. I think that's a really, really good thing you did. Was it consciously or were you just interested in meeting people in general? Yeah, somewhat conscious. Oh, really? Somewhat conscious. That's good. Yeah, yeah <laughs> although I thought it was going to be the portfolios that did the of course. portfolio that did it. Yeah. It wasn't. No. It took me by surprise kind of, you know, it's like just apparently some impression I left on someone meant an email from some person to another, and then all of a sudden there yeah. was some interview. Now, yeah. then you have to pass it, of course. Exactly. Yeah? So there's some technical assessment and whatnot, and it's the first job. So, you know, you also have to know what to expect. Yeah. Now, I also made sure that the, that the, the places I wanted to get into were not the first interviews I took. Okay. Because chances are the very first interview, it's not gonna be your best one. No. You have to experience that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I had that as well. I interviewed a lot. And I did do it for the positions I wanted to get into. Um, so I didn't give myself some time to ramp up. But yeah, at some point you get better at interviewing. And then that that's what gets you the job. Yeah, yeah. so I get that. I think the meetups thing, I, I don't know what your opinion is, but I think that you can still do that because there's still a lot of meetups. Although they're not uh, as much really? as they used to be. Okay, because I, I've been looking lately and okay. it's my impression is it's been drying up. So it's moved online so that they can have bigger audiences. Yeah. Probably San Francisco still has that thing going on. But even for a you know, whatever, a medium sized tech hub like Amsterdam, mm. I think it's or it's Utrecht. Or it's not is dry not, dry? Yeah, kind of. I see I so I don't know how it used to be, but I see like a few meetups, a couple meetups, let's say a month or maybe one a week of things that are interested in the software domain. Maybe it's because I'm Max Ebia and we also ho host well, meetups, right, let's right, say. Right, right, right. But that's why I, I see them more. I don't go to all of them. Um, I've been to one Kotlin related one, even though I don't even program in Kotlin, just to see what the vibe was. Yeah. And I did enjoy kind of talking to people and being like, 
So where do you guys work? What do you do? Like, that's a good vibe. But since you're saying it's kind of drying up and it's moved online, how would you then distinguish yourself nowadays? Well, still go. If there is something, go. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, I, th I think you're reaching out to people. Mm. Um, maybe not necessarily the first... If you don't know anyone, maybe you, you likely know someone who knows someone. Yeah. Um, just asking, you know, like, do you know anyone who works in that, in that field who will be willing to talk about it? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know where to get started either. I probably didn't even know about meetups. Mm. But, you know, you got to start somewhere starting, yeah. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of just being behind your laptop and reading all the blog posts, especially all of the blog posts written from a perspective that's maybe not relevant, like it's in a different city mm. or someone had a different educational background or, right? Yeah. You have to find your path. Exactly. That's the... Yours. I think that's the hardest one and they're always going to be unique, I feel like as well. It's going to be similarities, but just by virtue of being unique as a person, your path is also going to be unique, mm -hmm. I feel like. But many yeah. of them start out in similar ways, right? Yeah. So there's some, there's some beaten tracks mm. you can try to take, like uh, the consultancies, mm. right? There's different flavors of those, um, but that will expose you to a lot of different situations very quickly, probably. Yeah. Just throw you <laughs> to hard stuff, mm -hmm. likely. You know, there's traineeships, and then there's everything else, which is actually the majority. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Would you still, because I, I had an opinion on traineeships when I started out, I didn't like the commitment of, let's say, a year and a half or two years, even one year, of being stuck, and if I wanted to get out, I would have to pay a fee to get out. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, because of that oh, educational wow. ramp up. That's what traineeships... Oh, wow. That's my connotation with traineeships. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my... <laughs> Yeah, so when I joined ING, I think I had a choice between joining the traineeship or going straight into the job. I was okay. Like, just give me the job. Yeah. If the point of the traineeship is to get me that job. <laughs> then give me the job. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also the pay was better. Of course. Because they don't have to reserve, right, your your education costs. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think... Although I think I, I negotiated as a must that I would get some courses with uh, GoData Driven, your subsidiary. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. That was really important to me. I was like, okay, whatever the first one is, it should maximize the situations I'm exposed to and learning, whatever the first thing is. So yeah, that was my mechanism. I'm like, okay, got to get that training and some kind of gig where I can do different projects. Yeah. Not just work on one super long report that's going to take three years to write or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gain as much experience as you can and different perspectives. Yeah, because that way you'll, you know, You'll run into things that you realize actually drain your energy. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll, you'll find some part of some industry that you can just throw yourself, com just completely immerse yourself into. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. When we're talking about portfolios, because I, I have an idea of what I would build, let's say from a software engineering point of view, but when it comes to data and data scientists, what, what would you put in a portfolio to then also have, let's say, as a resume? Because I think connections are, are going to be valuable, but a portfolio, I wouldn't say it's un, it's not valuable. No, I think what a portfolio, or well, most portfolios are going to have, say, most portfolios are not going to contain some kind of GitHub project that has like 20,000 stars, yeah. right? And even if it does, someone has to actually see it Exactly. <laughs> so if you're applying and no one clicks on the link of your profile, then That's it. it was actually, yeah? Yeah. Um, so really, I think what people are looking for is that it gives a good general impression, like, oh, this person did something. But it's also not a necessity, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, having a few samples of code that you wrote, I think that's the main value, so people can check it out before having to commit to inviting you and having some coding interview. Yeah. Um, anything that, you know, if there is any academic work you did and you are allowed to open source it, why not do that? Mm -hmm. No brainer, I yep. think. Um, and that's it. I mean, don't take it way too serious, in my opinion. Okay. I think it will have, you know, diminishing returns. If you, like, if you put all your energy in that and, it's not, and no energy is going into other 
ways of uh, being noticed or or standing out because I think right now the job market is a bit harder than when I got in. Yeah. So you have to stand out a bit more. I agree with that. Yeah. And real world experience beats you know uh, theoretical experience. Yeah. So internships probably help, mm. especially if you have something tangible at the end, right? If you can just say, I did this thing, especially if then the company writes an article about it or something like that. Yeah. It's like external proof point. Exactly. You can point to it. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like what you said when it comes to not going too deep on one of the aspects, right? Because you need a little bit of a lot of things yeah. to get the job at the end. You need maybe the connections because they can put in a good word or they know you, right? It's still it's still people interacting. People need to want you in their team. Uh, you need to show what you've done, but not to such a degree that you're only going to do that because otherwise it loses you'll, its purpose. Yeah, you'll be pigeonholed. Exactly. And you need to be visible and your resume needs to be up to par to get that first initial conversation at the table. And then you're at the table and then you have the interview. Is yeah. the interview, like how much can you prepare for the interview? And I don't know if it differs from software engineering to data science, but in software engineering, you have the typical, okay, let's do a, a pair programming session or you do a take home assignment and then you present uh, or you do nothing technical and you just talk about how, how you would do within a yeah, team, for yeah, example, yeah. to gauge your experience. I, I've seen, both of these styles. Yeah. And honestly, there was once I even rejected the job offer because the interview pr process gave me a bad impression. I was like, if, if, if someone can get that position without external validation or doing any kind of technical assessment, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to work there. Yeah, that speaks volumes. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, you, you're going to have to be able to answer some technical questions. Of course. Um, but don't think that you need to be able to answer all of them or from all different areas. Just know what you know, mm -hmm. right? So if you know that you took a course on something, you know, have, you know, your, your one paper sized summary of it, you know, you know it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that when it comes up, you know, they're, they're most likely to gonna ask questions about stuff that you are claiming to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and especially for an entry level position, I don't think anyone is gonna blame you for not knowing what yeah. you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. It's um, maybe it's because the job market is quite harsh that people look at it as kind of this big hill that they need to climb to get yeah. their first position. And I don't know if they're, they're doing exactly what we mentioned in, as in not just pigeonholing yourself in a portfolio and actually be visible on, on all sides of things and do your homework, right? What you've put in that, you know, you should actually know because that's what they're going to ask about. They're not going to ask you what you don't know or what you said uh, you didn't know, because then why why would they hire you? They're going to know more talking about what you said you know uh, and learn exactly. from that than from the unknowns there. Exactly. So yeah, I don't know if it's the market or the combination, but I do think it's still very much doable to prepare yourself to it. The preparation is worth it. Yeah, right. I mean, of course, it depends on what you're putting your energy into. Mm -hmm. uh, but preparing for techno in technical interviews, I mean, it helps you work on fundamentals. It's also easy to go completely overboard with it. Yeah. Should just be appropriate for what you're aiming for, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And with that. Uh, so something I noticed with people who are just getting started is that they, and I maybe had the same issue a bit. If you're coming out of university and you were a good student, you're not so used to like not, you know, many of them didn't have so many failing grades, right? Ah. And maybe being rejected is a fail is a fail. Yeah, or it can feel like one. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you see it as a numbers game instead or like a process of improving and sometimes you have a shot, sometimes you don't, but you need to show up to know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get what you're saying there. It's, um, my brother was looking for a job. He landed one, but the whole period leading up to it, it was, yeah, disappointment, let's yeah. say, or a rejection or not even getting invited a seat at the table and not getting the feedback. Like those are all, contributing wow, to this is feeling. that dominant huh yeah yeah it's, uh, yeah and i could see it like i could see no, the incentives really. just don't make sense it, there is no upside almost I, well, or maybe i'm misunderstanding the situation but i don't think there's much of an upside for a company no to provide very honest feedback to the applicants uh, who didn't make it i get it but it's it's a way of giving back i would say that's yeah. the only incentive no, it, right it it feels like the right thing to do yeah but i i get that time wise crunch time you don't have to do it so it's easier not to do it um, and also he, he perceived, for example, things in the interview rounds that he would say like, is this a company I want to work for? 
Is this a company I want to work with? Just by virtue of recruitment, recruiters saying what they were going to do, uh, being on time for certain sessions, calling when they said they would, things get sloppy. And also when the market is worse, it gets <laughs> When the market sloppier. is worse, it will get sloppier. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I feel like. Because they can get away. Well. Why not? Why not? Because yeah. then uh, just go to someone else. But then this, this notion of kind of disappointment or this notion of a failure is again a kind of combination of circumstances, right? It's not just the yeah. person that's applying. It's the company, it's their internal organization. Yeah. Maybe they don't have budget you anymore. You might not even know how many people applied for that one position. Exactly. I mean, I remember, I think at some point I was involved in some funnel, well, on, I mean, on the hiring side, a funnel that had like for every position there were like 300 CVs. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. It makes, you know, if you didn't get invited, it might not be you. No, no, it doesn't have to be you. I mean, it could literally be the software that's scanning the CV. Yeah. You might not, your name might not even have shown up uh, at the hiring manager's table. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, by the way, why the networking part, you know, your name can end up in a different pile. Yeah. On top of the pile. And the smaller <laughs> the companies are, the higher your chances are that stuff like that can happen. Yeah, that's because a great they, they don't see that as a problem. It's just how it works. Yeah. Yeah, you know a guy. Yeah. Exactly. That's a great point. I'm wondering, let's say when you land the job, how can you make sure that your growth doesn't stagnate? You mentioned a few things and you mentioned one of the things that stuck with me is actually making sure you can finish things and hopefully multiple things in the same year instead yeah. of just one long trajectory which yeah. might not finish. Well, you don't have to be sure you can finish it. No, no. But it helps. Yeah. Right. A more, a more certain percentage, yeah. let's say. Yeah. Or if, even if something feels futile in terms of the final impact, um, well, someone made that decision to undertake that. Mm -hmm. uh, probably it wasn't you who yeah. decided that. You know, is there something you can get out of it anyway? Um, you know, there are some projects which, whatever, to some of the people who are in it, feel like there's very like, high likelihood it's going to fail, but you're going to probably at least get a conference talk out of it. Mm. Yeah. There's so many, you know. <laughs> that's a that's a thing? <laughs> Exam yeah, I think really? so. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because I wouldn't say that would be but a thing. But you can, you know, if you have something short that fails, it's a good story. You know, if you have a really long odyssey and it fails, then you feel like your whole That's year rough. was wasted. Exactly. Yeah. Then you can start again. But is that is that how you grow really quickly, let's say, as a data scientist? Is by doing more of those in a shorter amount of time? Or how do you make sure you're you're growing as fast as possible? Yeah. So well, I, at the time, getting started, really enjoyed being part of two different things at the same time. Mm. But I think that has to suit you. Yeah. Because when, when there was a downtime in one thing, it's probably compensated by happy times in the other one. Okay. Um, I kind of had to do that also because there were more projects with a lot of moving parts and international and politics. So we had to, you know, there were quiet times. Okay, yeah. And I'm not very good with those quiet times. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be busy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, then I, because then I start to think about why is it quiet? Mm. What do I need to push? What do I do and now? Then, and then I start to go outside of my sphere of influence mm. with my worries. And that's not good. Yeah, it can be bad. Yeah. 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 No, so how, how to maximize um, the learning or takeoff, you know, the, uh, so the variant of being be two things at once is like, you know, expose yourself to different situations mm -hmm. the, because that way you will get the most learning in terms of not just the content, but about what vibes with you. Mm. Um, Maybe you don't like writing an, an analysis. You know, if you, if you like analysis, but you don't like writing, writing reports is going to make you unhappy. Mm. That's a good thing to come out of. You know, if that took you half a year to learn yeah. because of a project, that's a great outcome. Yeah, take that with you. Take that with you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can vary the, uh, the technologies and the methods in the beginning. Just expose yourself to, you know, different methodologies, even families of methodologies. Uh, not everything is deep learning, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the people that you work with are okay. going to have the huge impact, I think. Yeah. Because um, just like you were saying, you ask for feedback a lot in the beginning of a new venture. Um, the outside perspective, people from the outside sometimes pick up way quicker on some aspects of what you're doing than, than you can yourself. Of course, there are some other things you notice. 
really important to be around people who have more experience, especially in the beginning. Yeah. And that, that's, I think, what kind of what I described in, when we're just starting out talking that that's kind of what went wrong. Mm. The, first, the first project I did professionally. Yeah. Uh, because I went in with someone and they left and I decided to stay on for too long. Exactly. Yeah. That's not a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. And it's something I, I think always it would be good, even if you're the highest on the totem pole, hiring someone that you can learn from mm -hmm. or that is better in some aspects is always going to be good. It's going to make you better professional, I feel like. Yeah. So I, I would say always try and work yeah. with people that you can yeah. learn from. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, but in, in the so, so yes. And in the beginning, the focus I think is more about also the, the content, how do you conduct yourself as a professional, maybe other people spotting things about you you didn't know, like what strengths you have. Yeah. Maybe you're too humble. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you don't take enough risks or, yeah. That's the type of things people will talk about in the beginning, but in the beginning also, of course, the, the actual content, like how do you, how do you do how, the thing? How do I work? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. When we're talking about feedback, is there something that really stuck with you kind of early on that someone mentioned? Yeah, there was one piece of feedback someone gave me. Well, uh, yeah, I think the second year mm. that just really stuck with me because I was, I was really unwilling to take on, uh, to like accept certain risks sometimes. Okay. Um, Whereas actually the, the, the impact of that risk, well, it wasn't gonna come back to me, but I just did, wasn't comfortable with it. Mm. And then someone confronted me with that and goes like, okay. So, you know, you keep saying no to X, Y, Z. Yeah. Probably the outcome is gonna be better if you say yes or really leave. Okay, well. So you have to make a stand, you know, you can't be in between all yeah. the time. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you disagree with something, you're gonna have to, you know, commit to the decision or leave. Mm. Well, I think that, politicians are best at that, right? So I, I think so. <laughs> is that did you commit or did you leave? Because that's an interesting one. I committed there, and the outcome. Yeah. Uh, the outcome is like a very good friend now. Oh, that's really not cool. the person who gave the feedback, but someone who I met through that project, and then everything turned out all right. It's a it's a, it's a fine line on the CV, but I know now that that area, I'm not sure if I would touch it again. Yeah, exactly. It's a learning either way, but I like that it had a great outcome. Yeah, in that yeah. way. Well, may <laughs> maybe <laughs> rationalizing it a bit after. Could be, fact, right? yeah, yeah, could be. <laughs> I think that's also better to then dwell on the positive instead of the negative in that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. when it comes to, because this is kind of my final thought, I've never worked with data scientists in the same team Maybe that's because I, I didn't touch as much, I haven't touched as much data components, but do data scientists work, let's say, together with software engineers or data engineers in the same product team, same way of working, or is it more isolated data, data scientists in a team in and of its own? What have you experienced or, or how is the way of working? Mm -hmm. I've seen a bit of both. Okay. Um, this depends a bit on just the company, mm. what they're trying to accomplish with it. Yeah. Um, there's also the two kinds of applying data science. So one is informing how the product should be built. That's mm -hmm. more like analyst in a way. Yeah. Um, I think uh, product managers rely heavily on this on this profile. Mm -hmm. I think Booking.com in the Netherlands is a very good uh, example of a company that relies where the uh, product is really informed by what those data scientists who act like the analyst for that product. It drives the product direction. The other side of it is maybe when you put statistical methods in your product. Mm. That's a very different kind of, you know, your, your day will look very different if you're that kind, you know, type A or type B. Exactly, yeah. These are actually totally different jobs almost. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy the one where the statistics and the math and the, you know, whatever the methodologies are, they end up in the product. Mm. I find that most exciting. But, you know, it can be anywhere in the whole how it works, like forecasting for energy companies, right? So they gotta know, all right, chances that we need this much energy between that and that time are, you know, what's the 99th percentile of the demand? Exactly, yeah. Then, you know, the product itself is based on stats. Yeah, Yeah. I was thinking about the latter, so exactly what you, also your preference is, where it's part of the yeah. product. Yeah. How yeah. do you then make sure that it 
becomes a good part of the product or that it gets integrated properly in that way? Do you do that together with the the rest of the product team? Or have you seen that way of working? Ah, uh, you'll have to do it together, of course. Yeah, right. Um, in that case, it comes down to project management partially. Mm. I think so. Spotting the opportunity is one thing, but ideas are basically free. Everyone can have ideas all day long. Yeah. Um, that there, I've had to kickstart these little things very often, and you've got to be willing to kick to kill them also. So okay. maybe set yourself a date where you think, okay, I will try to have this thing. You know, if if I see this, then it will be right. You might not see that thing. You might see something else, but work towards that. You're probably going to justify you spending time on it. You're probably going to have to convince the people around you. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to give you input probably on what will make it a success or not. Yeah. Um, but when you're setting up, when you have this idea, I would say, you know, really write some clean document without distractions. This is what I'm going to try because of this. I know it's a success when I see ABC. Yeah. Um, what am I trying to learn in the first phase? Because in the, f the first thing you're going to build to get towards that goal, it's very unlikely to be the thing that ends up in production. Okay, yeah. At least I've seen usually, usually, unless a very similar thing had been built, you know, a couple months before that, it gets scrapped and rebuilt, mm. especially if it was built by just a data scientist. Okay. Yeah, simply because of the engineering skills involved in building something for production. I think we talked about tooling before. Mm -hmm. It's changing a bit because if you're in the right platform, yeah, yeah, there's less uh, engineering work to do. Yeah, it's more established. Yeah, no, but setting up the project right is a huge part of it, and then keeping momentum. Mm. It sounds so like every week you can you know what progress you made. Exactly. That that's kind of at least for me that helps. It sounds like this, I see experimentation as a skill and it seems like it's very valuable here also to let go and not be, like people always say, you're not, you're not your code, you're not the code that you write, which also means you need to be able to let it go and get it thrown in the trash and let it be redone in a mature <laughs> I'm way. I'm happy I'm not the code that Exactly, I write, yeah. yeah. But it, it feels like that is a skill you need to develop or it would be good to develop yeah. that experimentation mindset. Yeah. Is that yes, what you see as yes. well? Yes, And one thing, I mean, Especially if you have a leadership position in, in, in this whole story, you're gonna have to make clear mm -hmm. that it is experimentation. Yeah. And so to give them a real to give the people around you realistic expectations of okay, we're gonna try ten things this year. If one of them pays off, I'm happy. Yeah. Maybe I don't know what your number is, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be it's it's it has to be related to, you know, have we done this before? If we haven't, chances that we find, you know, the right things are lower. Do we know that in the same industry people tried this thing and it paid off. Mm. Um, you know, there's all these factors like this. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you just had the wrong idea and it will take a while to, to, to find that out. Mm -hmm. um, there is one, one little analysis you can do beforehand that sometimes kills your project before you start. And that's okay. a great outcome, I think, because it means you didn't even have to do the experiment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I Just an argument that. about maximum potential impact. You know, if the total impact it could ever have is, you know, it's not appropriate for the input you expect. I don't you shouldn't see do the that. point. There's probably other opportunities. Exactly. Of course, if this is the last opportunity, it's all you can do in the world, and then you do that. But Yeah, otherwise you have options. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I do this at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you do day one. Yeah. And also, because if you, if you identify the total impact it could have, it can help you get excited about doing it. Yeah, and get buy-in as well. Yeah. And that one. Yeah, it's, um, that's funny because that's probably one of the most similar things I can relate to. If there's a story on the board that I don't agree with or that I think we shouldn't build, I would rather not build it and have that conversation than start building it and in actuality figure out it's not being used or it's a nuisance, let's say. That, I think in general, with anything you do, might be a good skill to develop. Mm -hmm. Figure out if this is actually what we need to do versus the other things we can do because there's always going to be options. Yeah. Yeah. That's I the, think this is going to be um, a big topic for you in, uh, <laughs> as a product manager. <laughs> for product managers, for sure. Yeah, that's why I, I really look forward to it. Yeah. This was a blast, man, Masi. This was uh, a lot of fun. Same. Talking about kind of this career journey 
for people that get into the field nowadays. Also learning from how you did it, as well as how you've grown um, and how you would grow kind of starting out now with the technologies that are available, looking at the people, the tools, and what needs to be done idea-wise to production. Is there anything that's still missing that you'd like to add? No, I love this. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good stuff. Then yeah. thank you so much for coming on. And we'll, uh, we'll round it off here. Thank you for listening. I'm going to put all Masi's socials in the description below. Check them out. Let them know you came from our show. And with that being said, thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next one.